Well, hello everybody. Good evening. I hope you are all doing well this day, and it's good to see so many of you here. Hello, Vingle. Hello, Alshaya Tori, and hello, Valtra. And to the rest of you who are lurking outside of the chat, it's great to have you here. Today, this is the final episode of um, Amazing Advent. We've I've been doing a number of streams over December uh, in the run-up to Christmas. This is the final one. And today we are looking at the question of whether the English have a culture. Where is this, this question coming from? Well, yesterday, some of you will have seen that I did a stream with Rupert August and uh, Justine Brown's bookshelf uh, on Merry England. And this is part of the English Restoration series. We've been, I guess, trying to to look at a number of aspects of English culture, English history and identity, which maybe aren't so well known today. Uh, and, and also, and, and for that reason, to try and recover them and maybe through these conversations provide ways in which all of us can uh, more readily live these things in our lives today or think about how we can bring them back or the good parts of them back at least. And, and, and as I was doing reading for this uh, this discussion, I came across uh, some passages in George Orwell, uh, George George Orwell, and uh, William Hazlitt's essays upon the subject, uh, which struck me as quite interesting because they they were trying to delineate particular characteristics of the English, uh, certain types of behavior, certain attitudes, a certain feeling that English people may have had in the 19th and early 20th century, and indeed in their view through history, uh, and so demarcate uh, the distinctives. I thought this was interesting because in our society today, if you ask somebody what's distinctive about being English or what is English culture, I think you would often get a somewhat, well, one of the three sorts of responses. One would be something like um, looking to certain things on the television or in popular culture. So EastEnders, uh, the football, um, the Houses of Parliament, maybe, uh, X Factor, and so on. Uh, going down the pub, that sort of thing. You would get a list of things that English people do, but you wouldn't necessarily get somebody who, somebody giving you a, an explanation of the attitude or, um, yeah, the attitude that's distinctive to English people. And this leads to the second kind of response, which is that you would just be totally flummoxed. How do I actually answer this question? And this seems to be in part because in, in the UK today, many of us live as global citizens or as citizens without a place of home, that we belong to a global culture or maybe a Western culture devoid of roots. And our primary belonging is not to England, but to various subcultures. So it could be to the sensible center or the distant right, or it could be something like um, a, a chess club, let's say, or your football team, and so on. We seem to be in a vacuum, uh, uprooted, and this is in contrast, uh, and, and, and um, much of what we take to be kind of our culture belongs in other places, like America, and even around the world. So what we wear to work, the suit, is worn pretty much everywhere, apart from the Middle East. Um, many of our kind of conventions, like democratic, uh, representative democracy, that's around the world as well. Uh, and things like human rights, well, they're supposed to be universal. So many of the things that we take for granted, many things we experience within our within our lives seem to be features of a global system, not just of a, a distinctively English one. 
And this is in contrast, I think, to even the other British nations. So if you think of uh, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, there seems to be distinctive cultural aspects to these nations. Um, from my own experience as uh, having Scottish parents, when you go up to Edinburgh, you're immediately hit by the sound of the bagpipes and of men uh, playing them in kilts. There's the, the good old Jacobite songs that people sing, uh, retold and reclaimed by the Corries in the 20th century. You have Burns suppers, you have Cayley dancing, and then you have the countryside itself. And all of this gives a certain um, feel or flavour to the place. Um, and the, these tradition seems to be a distinctively Scottish thing. In Wales, you have the Welsh language built into the very fabric of society and very distinctive things like a, a very strong Welsh rugby tradition and the singing of Welsh hymns and so on. And within England itself, you do find maybe regional identities having this sort of flavour. So if you went to Cornwall, for example, there's a strong Cornish identity or the Yorkshireman. Everybody has a kind of sense. When, when you say Yorkshireman, you have a sense of character, um, a certain um, stubborn simplicity, perhaps, uh, a, a wee bit mean with their money. That's the stereotype, right? But, there, but there's a certain character that you automatically think of when you think of these different places, a certain aesthetic, and it's rooted in a certain set of historical events and trajectories. But when you come to the idea of England today, well, it doesn't seem to quite have that same uh, reality or not that immediate upfront uh, culture that you might think of with um, Tartan, let's say, with Scotland. And, and I appreciate that's a, a rather on the surface uh, analysis of Scottish culture um, created by Walter Scott. But my point is more you think of something distinctive. And the same is with around the world, too. When you think of China or India, there's a certain set of images or um, cultural practices, cultural dress, uh, buildings like the Taj Mahal or the Great Wall of China, food. They all come to mind. With England, there may be some foods, but it's not as obvious or immediate. And um, then this comes to a third sort of answer, which is primarily pushed by, um, I, I would say, the left in this country. Um, it's not the traditional left. It's not like the uh, English working class uh, representatives of the 1970s who were fiercely patriotic and for um, English, kind of retaining Englishness. And that goes back to the 19th century with figures like William Morris. No, it's more a, a global leftism and progressivism, uh, which, hmm, how would you put it? It seeks to, to tear down the old order and replace it with a universal uh, egalitarianism. And it it refuses to acknowledge uh, an English or British distinctive culture. And I have a couple of videos to demonstrate this point. Um, I, I may get uh, demonetized for these, I'm not sure, but uh, hopefully it will be okay. Um, speaking of which, please uh, do like uh, the stream. It makes a huge difference because the YouTube algorithm if you don't engage with the stream, if you don't kind of like it or send comments or a super chat, it thinks that you didn't um, enjoy it or weren't interested in it. And so it won't recommend you the, the channel as much. So please, please do engage. It makes a big difference. Um, so the first of these is, um, if I can get it up, is from an HSBC advert which uh, ha has been, it's been on TV quite a bit. It's one of, they've, they've done a number like this, but this was the one that I wanted to show. And um, 
yeah, let's play it and then we can... What? Yeah, let's play it first. And then we can discuss after. We start the day with a Colombian, a Guatemalan, or a piping hot Costa Rican. And a Danish to go. We drive German, German, Japanese, German, and we ride Taiwanese. We watch American movies on Korean tablets and struggle with Swedish flat packs. Our heroes hail from Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and often Belgium. We eat Chinese, Italian, Indian, and go Dutch. Some of our best friends are Mexican, Siberian, Hungarian, and French. Hey. We live on a wonderful little lump of land in the middle of the sea. But we are not an island. We are part of something far, far bigger. So uh, you can see with this advert that the primary idea is that British life or English culture is, is not uh, this isolated thing, that actually much of what we enjoy, much of what we take for granted comes from around the world. They are products from all over, whether that be in the realm of food and drink, such as the coffee he was mentioning, in terms of sport, fashion, and so on. These are what makes us is um, the input of the whole world, as it were. And although, and and he does say that we are a great, uh, you know, a great little land, as he, I, I think he, he put it slightly differently, but it's, it's still a great country. It has its own dignity, I suppose. Um, but we belong to the whole world, or the whole world belongs in us. It's um. Well, we'll come to 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 think about it more deeply after I show you the second video. Um, and I want to do that first before we get into things. So this is from a TV show called Horrible Histories. It's a British TV show. It's based upon books. Um by Terry Deary, uh, the Horrible History series. They're, they're kind of um, fun children's books and uh, giving good, you know, historical events, very gory and uh, looking at all of the, um, I guess, the gross aspects of history. At the time, I didn't notice any kind of political messaging in it. Then they made the TV series, and then this came out after Brexit. Or, um, yeah, it must have been after Brexit. They did this episode on British stuff. And there's a song on British things. And this is the song. Oh, is the, is the sound not working? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it would help if I shared the audio, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. Let's, let's do that again. Um, so. <laughs> so, uh, you get the picture. There was an interesting line there that almost hardly anything is British in the view of the song, which I can, the only way I could describe it is anti-British propaganda, that song. I, I, th I think it's really trying to um, teach children who are watching this show that Britain has nothing distinctive of its own, or very little, that most of it is stolen from the rest of the world, and the British Empire is a purely evil creation. That's what that was doing, and that was paid for by the British taxpayer, because it's a BBC production. Uh, absolutely astounding. Um, but you, and, and uh, if anybody's interested, um, Carl Benjamin did a very good response video to this a, a few years ago. I think it's on a CAD daily. So if you want a, a specific breakdown of um, responding to it, check it out. Uh, I, I think he makes a really good point that so the the song claims that tea comes from India. Well, when the British ruled India, there wasn't tea there originally. Uh, they They took it from China and realized that the Himalayas would be 
very fertile ground uh, for uh, tea growing. So it was the British who planted uh, tea in India in the first place. So it's not even uh, historically accurate. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, uh, even if that was true, right, I, I think um, this is an attitude that you see right a lot across the progressive wing today, uh, that Britain has no culture of its own, particularly England. And what little culture it has is patriarchal. It is um, uh, misogynistic. It is xenophobic and uh, filled with racism and needs to be deconstructed and torn down. Um, and it, it is unique in being a country with very little culture of its own. It's a conglomeration of all different cultures. And uh, so I wanted to, what I wanted to do today, because people have made very good responses to this already. And I think anybody who's seen videos on this channel will know that England most definitely does have a culture um, that goes back thousands of years. And that the people of this island, uh, many of them, the majority, share the ancestry and culture of those people who lived here thousands of years ago. There is a native and indigenous population. And many of the things that are today, such as the monarchy, trace their descent from Saxon times. Right? We can trace the lineage from Alfred the Great, from William the Conqueror, down to Queen Elizabeth. All of that is part of our culture. But what I really wanted to ask today was beyond kind of giving a defense of English culture, which I don't think, I think other people have done very well already, is why can they get away with this sort of argument? Because uh, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, and around the world, it's not immediately obvious what is distinctively English in the same way as maybe it is in other contexts. I think it's there. But but so I want and, and so that allows for this sort of argument to to be made and for it to have some degree of plausibility is the wrong word, but it um some degree of purchase that it can't just be laughed out of the room as it should be. And in fact, what I'm going to argue is the the reason, uh, the very things that they're pointing to, that we have all of these things from around the world within our culture, that we enjoy all of these things, is rooted in English culture and a certain attitude towards life, which even if it wasn't unique to England, has been a part of English culture and has then gone on to dominate uh, the globe. So um, to kind of begin that point, I wanted to read a passage from George Orwell's um, The Lion and the Unicorn. This is a, a short book that he wrote on socialism and the English genius. And I wanted to read from part two, where Orwell is trying to um, define certain characteristics of the English people. And I read this passage yesterday in the Merry England stream, so you'll have to forgive me for repeating myself. Here are a couple of generalizations about England that would be accepted by almost all observers. One is that the English are not gifted artistically. They are not as musical as the Germans or Italians. Painting and sculpture have never flourished in England as they have in France. Another is that, as Europeans go, the English are not intellectual. They have a horror of abstract thought. They feel no need for any philosophy or systematic worldview. Nor is this because they are practical, as they are so fond of claiming for themselves. One has only to look at their methods of town planning and water supply, their obstinate clinging to everything that is out of date and a nuisance, a spelling system that defies analysis, 
and a system of weights and measures that is intelligible only to the compilers of arithmetic books, to see how little they care about mere efficiency. But they have a certain power of acting without taking thought. Their world-famed hypocrisy, their doubled-faced attitude towards the empire, for instance, is bound up with this. Also, in moments of supreme crisis, the whole nation can suddenly draw together and act upon a species of instinct, really a code of conduct, which is understood by almost everyone, though never formulated. The phrase that Hitler coined for the Germans, a sleepwalking people, would have been better applied to the English. Not that there is anything to be proud of in being called a sleepwalker. But here it is worth noting a minor English trait, which is extremely well marked, though no, not often commented on, and that is a love of flowers. This is one of the first things that one notices when one reaches England from abroad, especially if one is coming from Southern Europe. Does it not contradict the English indifference to the arts? Not really, because it is found in people who have no aesthetic feeling whatever. What it does link up with, however, is another English characteristic, which is so much a part of us that we barely notice it. And that is the addiction to hobbies and spare time occupations, the privateness of English life. We are a nation of flower lovers, but also a nation of stamp collectors, pigeon fanciers, amateur carpenters, coupon snippers, darts players, crossword puzzle fans. All the culture that is most truly native centers round things which even when they are communal are not official. The pub, the football match, the back garden, the fireside and the nice cup of tea. The liberty of the individual is still believed in, almost as in the 19th century. But this has nothing to do with economic liberty, the right to exploit others for profit. It is the liberty to have a home of your own, to do what you like in your spare time, to choose your own amusements instead of having them chosen for you from above. The most hateful of all names in an English ear is Nosy Parker. It is obvious, of course, that even this purely private liberty is a lost cause. Like all other modern people, the English are in the process of being numbered, labelled, conscripted, coordinated. But the pull of their impulses is in the other direction, and the kind of regimentation that can be imposed on them will be modified in consequence. No party rallies, no youth movements, no coloured shirts, no Jew baiting or spontaneous demonstrations. No Gestapo either, in all probability. But in all societies, the common people must live to some extent against the existing order. The genuinely popular culture of England is something that goes on beneath the surface, unofficially and more or less frowned on by the authorities. One thing one notices if one looks directly at the common people, especially in big towns, is that they are not puritanical. They are inveterate gamblers, drink as much beer as their wages will permit, are devoted to bawdy jokes, and use probably the foulest language in the world. They have to satisfy these tastes in the face of astonishing hypocritical laws, licensing laws, lottery laws, etc., which are designed to interfere with everybody, but in practice, allow everything to happen. Also, the common people are without definite religious belief, and have been so for centuries. The Anglican Church never had a real hold on them, it was simply a preserve of the landed gentry, and the nonconformist sects only influenced minorities. And yet they have retained a deep tinge of Christian feeling, while almost forgetting the name of Christ. The power worship, which is in the which is the new religion of Europe, which has infected the in English intelligentsia, has never touched the common people. They have never caught up with power politics. The realism which is preached in Japanese and Italian newspapers would horrify them. 
One can learn a good deal about the spirit of England from the comic coloured postcards that you see in the windows of cheap stationers shops. These things are a sort of diary upon which the English people have unconsciously recorded themselves. Their old fashioned outlook, their graded snobberies, their mixture of bawdiness and hypocrisy, their extreme gentleness, their deeply moral attitude to life are all mirrored there. So what immediately strikes me about this passage, and Hazlitt says much the same, is that the English are a nation um, which has a very strong division between work and pleasure, or leisure, I should say. You know, the phrase, work hard, play hard. And this was reflected in the medieval calendar, as we were looking at yesterday, that you had your period of fasting uh, and working hard in the darkness of winter in Advent. And then for the 12 days of Christmas, you would be a permanent holiday. You weren't supposed to work during that period. You would be partying, feasting, engaging in games and so on. And so there's this idea that when you're in your private time, when you're not working, you are very much free to do what you like. One isn't supposed to tell you what to do. And that people follow their instinctive or the things that they desire. So that could be gardening. And as all well pointed out, England is a nation of gardeners and flower lovers. We have the Chelsea Flower Show. We have on TV gardening programs um, dedicated to giving techniques and advice about how to grow certain flowers in your garden. Where around the country, there are uh, Britain in Bloom competitions where villages will have flower displays trying to show that they are, you know, they have the most beautiful flower display in the country. And it's all very pretty and delightful. And you'll even find places like um, Anik Gardens, which isn't too far from me. People go there on their time off to enjoy the lovely flowers. The, the uh, thumbnail for this video was a picture of uh, then Prince, now King Charles, gardening. And he's a fond gardener and lover of plants. This is something which, um, you know, the garden, it's part of your, it's often a place connected to your home, to your private domain, somewhere that you can spend time apart without anybody interfering. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. Nobody can kind of demand you do it a certain way. You can tend to your flowers. You can nurture them. They're your project in the privateness of your own home. Or as a village, you know, you as a community, you might grow flowers together and decorate the neighborhood. Nobody's telling you to. They can't force you to do it. But it's something that you want to do. Another example would be sports. And here I want to definitely read um, the Hazlitt section because he just goes through it. And he's talking, he's a 19th century writer and he's, he's discussing the English love of um, entertainment and sport. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll actually uh, share the screen for this so you'll be able to, to see what I'm reading. So we're reading from down here. They, the English, says Frossart, amuse themselves sadly after the fashion of their country. They have indeed a way of their own. Their mirth is a relaxation from gravity, a challenge to dull care to be gone, and one is not always clear at first whether the appeal is successful. The cloud may still hang on the brow, the ice may not thaw at once. To help them out in their new character is an act of charity. Anything short of hanging or drowning is something to begin with. They do not enter into their amusement, amusements the less doggedly because they may plague others. They like a thing the better for hitting them a rap on the knuckles, for making their blood tingle. They do not dance or sing, but they make good cheer, eat, drink, and are merry. No people are fonder of, of field sports, Christmas gambles, of practical jests. Blind man's bluff, Hunt the Slipper, Hot Cockles, and Snapdragon are all approved English games, full of laughable surprises and hairbreadth scapes, and serve to amuse the winter fireside 
after the roast beef and plum pudding, the spiced ale and roasted crab thrown hissing hot into the foaming tankard. Punch, not the liquor, but the puppet, is not, I fear, of English origin, but there is no place I take it where he finds himself more at home or meets a more joyous welcome, where he collects greater crowds at the corners of streets, where he opens the eyes or distends the cheeks wider, or where the bangs and blows, the uncouth gestures, ridiculous anger, and screaming voice of the chief performer excite more boundless merriment or louder bursts of laughter among all ranks and sorts of people. An English theatre is the very throne of pantomime. Nor do I believe that the gallery and boxes of Drury Lane or Covent Garden, filled on the proper occasion with holiday folks, big or little, yield the palm for undisguised, tumultuous, inextinguishable laughter to any spot in Europe. I do not speak of refinement of mirth. This is no fastidious speculation, but of its cordiality on the return of these long-looked-for and licensed periods. And I may add here, by way of illustration, that the English common people are a sort of grown children, spoiled and sulky perhaps, but full of glee and merriment, when their attention is drawn off by some sudden and striking object. The maypole is almost gone out of fashion among us, but May Day, besides its flowering hawthorns and its pearly dews, has still its boasted exhibition of painted chimney sweepers, and their Jacko Green, whose tawdry finery be bedizened faces, unwanted gestures, and short-lived pleasures call forth good-humoured smiles and looks of sympathy in the spectators. There is no place where trap ball, fives, prison base, football, quoits, bowls are better understood or more successfully practised, and the very names of a cricket bat and a ball make English fingers tingle. What happy days must Long Robinson have passed in getting ready his wickets and mending his bats, who, when two of the fingers of his right hand were struck off by the violence of a ball, had a screw fastened to it to hold the bat, and with the other hand still sent the ball thundering against the boards that bounded, old Lord's cricket ground. What delightful hours must have been his in looking forward to the matches that were cut to come, in recounting the feats he had performed and those that were past. I have myself whiled away whole mornings in seeing him strike the ball, to the farthest extremity of smooth, level, sunburnt ground, and with long, awkward strides count the notches that made victory sure. Then again, cudgel playing, quarterstaff, bull and badger baiting, cock fighting, are almost the peculiar diversions of this island, and often objected to us as barbarous and cruel. Horse racing is the delight and ruin of numbers, and the noble science of boxing is all our own. Foreigners can scarcely understand how we can squeeze pleasure out of this pastime. The luxury of hard blows given or received, the joy of the ring, the perseverance of the combatants. The English also excel, or are not excelled in wiring a hare, in stalking a deer, in shooting, fishing and hunting. England to this day boasts her Robin Hood and his merry men, that stout archer and outlaw and patron saint of the sporting calendar. What a cheerful sound is that of the hunters, issuing from the autumnal wood and sweeping over hill and dale. I think it's uh, quite an amazing passage there by um, Hazlitt. But the point I wanted to get across was that he too observed that in this country there's a strong emphasis upon uh, merriment and amusement outside of work. That In your leisure time, you're free to do what you want. And that's manifested in so many different kinds of activity, um, which I guess you could say are somewhat simple pleasures, uh, things which are, you know, you're, you're doing a certain activity, and maybe it's watching Punch and Judy, a, theat a pantomime it's silly it's nonsensical but in the moment it's a bit of fun or when it comes to sport the creation of many games in this country uh, and the codification of their rules 
because we in our spare time we want to compete against each other and uh, physically uh, contest ourselves all within a kind of framework which allows for great stories to be told of sporting endeavor and there's such a range of sports as well football rugby tennis golf you know darts snooker cricket these are all taken for granted today this this division between the um i guess the time when you're allowed to be managed and the private sphere has its roots i believe in the english legal tradition i i've heard it said i can't you know i'm not a legal expert but that in england with its uh, basis on precedent there has been this idea deeply instilled that Whereas in other traditions, the government gives you rights. So you're, own, you're given certain um, privileges by the state um, and they can be removed or given at the state's leisure. And that's where they're derived. In the, and, and, and you could see like a Hobbesian social contract in that way that the state's there um, to protect the interests of the, the community to, to keep order and it will give you rights insofar as it keep you know it's amenable to order in the broader english tradition there's this idea that you already have rights just by being an englishman or an english woman and the state has to recognize these rights and if it doesn't then it you are right to rebel against it you see this idea in the 17th century with the wars, the civil wars against the crown. Various members of the uh, parliamentary forces, such as the levelers, would have said that, um, you know, we, we, we come from a nation where it's in our traditions from uh, Anglo-Saxon times, from Alfred the Great with his codification of the laws of the Saxon laws, of the, or the laws of the English, that the state cannot do anything without the people's consent. And that includes taking their property, i.e. through taxation. And, or, and, and they don't have the right to rule unless they uh, have uh, the consent of the people. Thus, um, for some, this meant that the king, who didn't have the consent of the people for taxation, and thus taking their property, had acted wrongly against the rights of the people the levelers went further and said we never consented to a king and indeed the king was an imposition from norman times uh william the conqueror the right um might makes right policy he took all of the property in england for himself and distributed it to his followers thus creating the aristocracy and so for the levelers uh the king and the aristocracy given that they stole uh their um, wealth and, and privileges and power ought to be overturned. They, they've gone against the natural rights of the, of the English people. Not everybody went that far. They were, these groups were rejected. But there was this strong idea of the king's tax policies, which hadn't had the consent of parliament, were illegitimate because they were taking people's private property. And with John Locke, you see this codified, right? The right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to personal and private property, which without the consent of the people, the state has no right to take. And you have the right to use and work as you see fit and benefit from that property too. But you also see another kind of dialectic within the English context, right? You have, and, and Orwell kind of mentioned it, you have Merry England, this carousing and uh, joyful um, festivities in the private sphere, which are not mandated from above, which are quite organic. Uh, so feasting at Christmas, for example. There's a certain chaotic and rebellious nature to them as well. Uh, yesterday we looked at the idea of the Lord of Misrule, so a servant who's promoted uh, for, the, for the Christmas season, for the 12 days to be the ruler of the court or the household 
and they are to oversee the merriment and games, maybe uh, encouraging uh, excess into greed and drunkenness and licentiousness before um, restoring the the rightful order of the you know the the king or the noble who keeps the moral order and social order and by extension the cosmological order but but you have this other strain within england of the puritan and this goes before the puritans and it's you know this, it's carried on after first and foremost i would say it's a desire to be sincere in the whole of one's life to certain transcendental or absolute principles or ideals. So for the Puritans in 17th century England, that meant the whole of one's life ought to be devoted to God and to obeying God and to glorifying God. And that meant being moral in the whole of one's life. And so that meant abstaining from sin where possible. But the Puritan zeal goes further than just personal devotion to God in all things it also had this confidence or uh, sense that because this is the best thing for people that if they have um if they devote themselves to god then in the next life they will have everlasting and infinite happiness which is the greatest good and this this is kind of the argument uh, lewis bailey would have made during this period he was who wrote one of the most important works, The Practice of Piety, really best-selling during the, the era. Well then, as it's in other people's like interest that they live this life, because they won't ever experience this happiness. Indeed, they'll only experience infinite and everlasting misery in hell. You have the right to manage their lives, to tell them what to think, what to feel, how they should act, what they should say, that you have the right to restrict their um, private doings in their homes. You're, you have the right to take away certain activities which are a, a danger to the health of their soul. You have a right to um, punish them when they break these, uh, these things. So you, basically you have a right to control the whole as the whole range of somebody's life and bring it into conformity with this higher value in a very strict way and so that is in conflict with this merry england idea not just in the the manifestation of um well we could say the the much the revelries right because even if it wasn't sinful there's this division over do you have control over somebody else's private sphere or not and these two principles seem to be in competition within english culture F from before the puritan era so in the medieval times as uh, rupert was saying yesterday and it works itself through to today as well and we'll see that later on in the stream but for now what what i want to emphasize is that there is this idea that in english culture very strong sense that and it's protected by the legal tradition it was cultivated and facilitated by it that once you're outside of your working arrangements you've gone home you have the right to do what you want and often that involves very various kinds of amusements and enjoyable activities. So then we move to the 19th century with uh, the Industrial Revolution and the development of machines which are able to produce more uh, products quicker. You have the division of labor. So um, it's not just like in the older tradition where one person was maybe uh, doing the whole process, making, uh, let's say, a scarf in the, uh, you know, they would uh, make the wool and then uh, knit it into the to the scarf. 
uh, now that you have uh, machines that are able to do part of the process, you can also specialize. And so one person makes the wool, then one person uses the wool to make a scarf, and then one person sells it. And it's a much more efficient system. Well, what, what you have with this period is that the development of the free market is facilitated by the Industrial Revolution. It's able to mass produce items which will be amusing to people. Uh, and even more than that, the, the free market of the 19th century is able to offer people new products and create new desires to for the development of wealth. Things which are not just organic. Let, let, let me put it like this. So in medieval England that we were looking at yesterday, you would have for Christmas and for Twelfth Night a great feast where everybody was invited. So the king would sit with the servants and they would eat the, the bull's head together. And uh, then they would dance together and so on. So it was a kind of equalizing event. A great big feast requires food. It requires cutlery goblets and, and so on. So somebody has to make these things, somebody has to sell them. But you could say this is a kind of organic relationship. The reason why the person selling this thing is there's already a demand for it. The feast demands it. And so therefore, um, somebody is supplying it. What you see in the 19th century is not only can traditional desires be met, but as part of this um, private sphere where people can choose uh, their delights, their pastimes, new items are created, new forms of leisure are created by the market. So in the 1840s, for example, the postcard uh, or the Christmas card was first developed. Let's see if I can show you a picture of it. Um, this was developed by a fellow who had created the post office service in Britain. Uh, and uh, he wanted to find a way of funding the post office, uh, getting it money. And so he and a friend developed the first Christmas card to be sold to members of the public who would then use this card. Um, they would have to use the postal service to send this card to their friends therefore giving money to the post service. Uh, I've managed to get a picture up of it. Um, there you are. So you can see that this is the first ever Christmas card. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Look, they're all up there um, feasting together, private time, having fun. Similarly, uh, the first Christmas cracker was also developed during this period. It was by a man who was developing uh, uh, sweeties. The the crisp. He had come across the French uh, bonbon, I believe it's called. And in the wrappers, he was including a little message, a little Christmas message. Then in the 1860s, he worked with a fireworks um, fellow who um, was able to put in, you know, when you, you open a cracker, it kind of snaps, right? There's a crack. Well, he worked to have this spark happen when you opened your sweetie wrapper. And so the development of the cracker was took place. Other examples might include the emergence of chocolate. Now, chocolate, uh, you know, the cocoa beans come from South America. And royal courts had been drinking hot chocolate for several centuries by this point. I think in the 17th century, you find uh, Charles II drinking uh, hot cocoa. It was quite bitter, but it was very much a luxury item that only the rich could afford. In the 19th century, you see in England the development of several, um, how would you put it, several chocolate companies, as well as in Switzerland and in Belgium, um, which which are for the, the the production of chocolates for for popular consumption. So you see the Cadburys 
emerge during this period with their dairy milk, their famous dairy milk, and their Bourneville chocolates. You see the um, uh, up in Yorkshire a number of uh, um, factories, so round trees, who developed. Uh, so we know them primarily now for like round trees, fruit pastels. But um, you also have the Kit Kat, I believe, was them. I think the Mars Bar, as well, because Nestle bought them over. So a number of their in um nestle's chocolates are round trees chocolates essentially uh you, you also have terry's up there terry's chocolate orange and and uh, uh, and what what you're seeing then is this development of a number of products which are brand new to the market but giving people more options as to how they spend their private time how they spend their money and uh the way that they can choose to um, amuse themselves. You're seeing then a commercialization of Merry England, perhaps. This um, exploiting this idea that people are free to, ch to choose what pleasures they indulge in, in their private sphere, and nobody can tell them what. And in a kind of, well, for Spengler, Oswald Spengler, the West is a Faustian civilization. That is, using machines, it seeks to conquer nature. It strives to dominate the infinite and grasp for the infinite. They think of um, Captain Kirk in Star Trek, you know, the opening uh, of each Star Trek episode, um, going where no man has gone before. That's very much the Faustian spirit. And with the Industrial Revolution and the free market, there's this idea, there's almost this attempt to create also and create products will which will satisfy all possible desires within the human heart. That whatever desire you have, you will be able to sate it through this mechanism, which will produce the thing that will sate it for you. And so we've moved from an, a purely organic merriment, a, a private thing where you're just doing it for your, you know, with your community or by yourself, of which the market's responsive to, to the market actually, it, it's, it's actually creating the demand it craves. Excuse me. And today we've seen that come to fruition. I, I think this is bound up with um, kind of the, in, in two ways. One is the British Empire, which uses the world and its resources as the basis for this kind of culture, uh, the free market culture, which is responding to this, this English uh, kind of uh, personal enjoyment and at the same time it then exports this market around the world first to cultural elites and then in time to kind of the the ordinary people of those of those places and indeed america which is an offshoot of the you know it, there's a, there's strong english aspects within american culture not just english but it's a major contributor you, you have the McDonaldization of the world, right? So the, the attempt to make the whole world, everybody within the world, a consumer, both a producer and a consumer. Uh, Rupert introduced me to this idea of homo economicus, that human beings are purely economic units, that their true value lies in what they can produce and what they can consume. This is very much the, the new model of the, of the, well, of modernity. And America um, takes this idea with the free market in opposition to communism. Very, very interesting kind of clash there. Um, it seeks to sate the desires of every population in the world, not just uh, of the Anglosphere anymore. And so you start seeing markets in Japan, right? And the whole development today, we, we could see this kind of, well, I'll, I'll come to that point in a second, sorry. Um, but yes, you, you see this 
moving across the world. So the the English desire for private pastimes and it being met by market demand has now gone global in the 20th century. At the same time, there is, I think particularly from the American influence, this this move towards an understanding of the self which is totally cut off from one's prior roots or community or identity and seeing one's identity as an act of self-actualization that you are what you choose to be you are um how you you are defined by your self-expression that we are the people who come from nowhere but decide where we want to be we are we become who we want to be or who we are born to be you know all these sorts of phrases the idea being that our fundamental path in life is to reach a point of self-expression and how do you do that within this society well you primarily do it through your economic choices you define yourself by your pastimes by what you do in your private life so that can be um and and we we see in our current culture there's almost unlimited choice in how you go about that so for example um something like uh some of you will have heard of the games workshop now this is a an institution which develops uh tabletop uh strategy games using models often from well from warhammer warhammer 40k and from the lord of the rings so they're kind of fantasy models this is a pastime that people engage in quite vociferously they love it they'll paint all the models they'll go and meet up with each other and play these games nobody's forcing them to they can choose to do that and the market is has created this thing that these these guys like another might be if you go to something like comic-con you'll see people dressed up in star wars costumes or uh, of their favorite video games and so on Uh, the internet has accelerated this process so now you can go online and find any community that you want to and join it essentially indeed even what we're doing here is a part of this um process right that nobody's forcing you to be here or at least i hope not uh nobody's forcing you um and uh you can choose which streamers within the the dr or sensible center that you want to that you want to watch that's totally up to you youtube is providing you with an almost unlimited range of people and ideas and topics that respond to your desires and indeed maybe create some of your own interests for for example for me i'd never come across thomas carlyle before um watching academic agents channel and from from that i started to get interested in him and read his books and so on so i became so that desire was born in me through engaging with this sort of community but essentially wherever you go in the world you will find now these sorts of private pastimes provided by the large corporations and institutions you go to japan the whole pokemon scene or anime in korea you've got the k-pop and all that all that sort of thing it seems this is all over the place my point is that the, the this is and, and this will be a slightly tricky thing to to work out so it's so bear with me my point is that this idea or the, the attitude which underlies this culture this global culture has its origins or at least one influence from the English um, distinction between, uh, well, love of the private pastime from the Merry England idea that was first harnessed by the free market in Victorian Britain 
and then universalized around the world. It relies on that distinction between that time where I can be managed at work and that time where nobody can manage me and I get to choose how I enjoy myself. And indeed, the, the thing I do when I'm by myself is I find a pastime, a hobby, a may or or some item that I enjoy, and I will go and pursue that. That seems to be the logic of much of the global order, of the global economy. It's all driven towards what we choose to do in our personal time. And that seems to be a key part of English identity, at least as Hazlitt and Orwell saw it. So what, what does that mean then? Well, if that is the case, it's hard to see it. It's hard to see it because it's been abstracted from its original particular context here and been elevated to a universal norm. It's just the, the water we move in. It's, it's something which is so universal that nobody seeks to question what assumptions, what cultural attitudes underlie it. And it may have been the case that other cultures had this distinction, but it was because of the English, um, the English had it, and it was blown up by the British Empire and the American Empire, that it is where it is today. And so when we hear HSBC saying, oh, well, we have Colombian coffee and our favourite footballers are from Chile and we eat Italian food and Indian food. This, These very products being here is in itself the point, that it's responding to the, the English slash British um, appreciation of the the right to enjoy yourself through various pastimes. And these include, and, and the market trying to supply that in all these different ways. It's because of that, that love of all, you know, of what we want to love, that we're presented with all of these things within our economy. If we weren't that kind of society, if we didn't have that attitude, if we were quite content to eat, maybe like, boiled potatoes and uh or what did they used to have oat cakes right if we were if we were quite happy with a simple diet and we didn't want amusements we wouldn't have all of these things in our economy because we wouldn't there wouldn't be a demand for it so i i think that's um that's a part of it and so we don't necessarily see that what we're engaging in, the very culture that that has all of these disparate influences and products and this almost, uh, dare I say it, multicultural feel is itself a product of the um, of this consumption aspect or, or the way that Merry England has been transformed into a consumer um, a consumer lifestyle in the private sphere. I hope that made some sort of sense. I want to just kind of move on to two slash three other ways that we see this and uh, before kind of wrapping it up. So in the, the English and Scottish and I would say Northwestern European uh, world, we have the emergence of the scientific method in the, well, really for, slightly before the, the Enlightenment, but the Enlightenment. And a large contribution to that is empiricism, which um, you know is particularly identified with British philosophy or philosophers, John Locke, George Berkeley, and David Hume. Now, empiricism was a reaction to uh, continental rationalism of Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. And these thinkers uh, thought that you could begin with abstract principles or rational, uh, you know, using your reason, you can think about the world from abstract principles and understand it as such from the implications of these 
principles. And indeed, if one reads Spinoza, it, it, it begins with a series of propositions, which he then works from in a kind of mathematical style to derive the metaphysical nature of reality and, you know, the ethical order too. For thinkers like Locke and Hume, this is precisely the wrong way to go about it. Uh, indeed, just because we can, re you know, have a coherent chain of reasoning, it doesn't mean that those propositions are correct. We need to test them against reality through experience and by via various methods, which I guess secure reliable experiences. So we might take a number of experiences of a thing to determine its nature. And um, this feeds into the rise of the scientific method, which um, Peter Harrison, who's a very important historian of science, probably the premier thinker in that field at the moment, he argues that uh, the scientific method or the modern version of it really has its um, beginnings in Protestant theology, which, you know, dominated Britain, uh, Germany, Holland. And it's no surprise that many of the leading scientists of the Enlightenment come from these countries. For um, Harrison, it comes from two doctrines. First, the Protestant emphasis upon sola scriptura, that we need to read the Bible in its original language and try to understand it in its original context. So the, the, the rise of biblical scholarship this fed into then uh, how people then approached uh, nature because in uh, say calvin he would say that there is the book of nature and the book of revelation the bible is the book of revelation it is god's revelation to reality uh, to, to the world sorry and uh, we need to study it if we want to know about god uh, in in these ways but by the same token when we come to nature we need to study it in a similar way, not from our own presuppositions, not from uh, kind of imposing doctrines upon it, but like the Bible, trying to see what's actually there, what's there in its actual context, using methods which are appropriate to seeing the true meaning of it and not just what we've already thought about it. So the idea of sola scriptura, moving beyond um, traditions and doctrines being imposed upon the text and trying to see what's actually in the text, an investigative model feeds into an investigative model of the natural world. But second, and I think this is far more important, is the doctrine of original sin. Now this is in Catholic traditions, but in Protestantism, it gets taken further. There's the idea that the human faculties are corrupted. For Calvin, and the Puritans, they're totally corrupted, that they are unable to do good uh, without the uh, divine intervention. And an implication of this is that we cannot trust what we think or what we feel in the unregenerate state, that although it seems right to us, because our faculties are corrupted by sin, because the way we think has been distorted by um, what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, that we've inherited the perversion that was within their decision to take the, the fruit from the forbidden tree. We can't rely upon our assumptions or how we think about rational principles, right? We need to use method, methods, reliable methods, that um, can test our thoughts and experiences to discern truth about the real world. So we need to externalize, we need to put our um, ideas under the microscope and rigorously examine them using these reliable methods, and then we will arrive at truth. This is very much the thrust in Francis Bacon's uh, inductive philosophy, that it goes beyond our corrupted uh, faculties. And through the gathering of observations and detecting patterns within them, we'll be able to have a reliable method of discerning the truth. And so we see many uh, scientists uh, from that part of the world, the northwest of Europe during this period, who have these sorts of assumptions, 
Uh, so somebody like Isaac Newton, for example. And um, the scientific method, it, so, so it's born within this, within that context, with these particular assumptions within these particular cultures. But as we see today, and many of the theories, for a start, that originate in these contexts are taken um, as kind of universal norms for granted. So we could say, although Newton's been surpassed as a kind of shorthand for the theory of motion, it's, you know, if you're actually working out uh, things, it's much easier than uh, Einsteinian uh, physics. You also have Darwin's theory of evolution, which is just taken as a as a norm today. Or, um, oh, what's the chap's called? Well, well, the um, the geologist is it James Hutton, who developed the theory of gradualism, that the world, um, the way that the rocks have formed over time is gradual it wasn't just kind of instant changes that it's um been thousands of mille well millennia essentially which has seen the formation of uh cliffs and rocks and so on and you can see this with the levels within rocks um these are all just taken for granted as part of our worldview today indeed the scientific method has become universalized around the world. And indeed, many scientists will say things that will almost abstract science from its original European context and say that it, it kind of belongs to humanity, that it's true in all contexts, that th with science, we will be able to revolutionize all of human civilization and perfect it. And so, and so it too has become globalized and removed from its original uh, European um, and, and to some extent, uh, British uh, moorings, and the same with empiricism. In, in, again, so like the, uh, the idea of the private sphere and the private pastime being shared around the world now so too has the scientific method and the scientific approach to knowledge and so whereas before this would have been in 19th century britain this would have been very distinctive to the british people or at least distinctive com compared to say like in africa or asia uh, very explicitly different today you have laboratories all around the world, you have scientists all around the world. And indeed, you actually find that the scientific is now in, it is being, is being worked back round, as is the free market, as an attack upon the original culture. So in the case of the free market, um, so this, uh, supplying all possible needs has been moved into a sphere where it's attacking those sorts of uh, traditions and um, or pastimes in England which are not global, which are not easily sellable and which are not um, which are not the most efficient. So for example pub culture, which is a huge part of this, private pastime, which goes back thousands of years. The, we still have pubs which uh, date from Norman times in existence. I think there's one in the bottom of Nottingham Castle. These places uh, are not, uh, they can't be shared around the world because there's a distinctive communal feel about them. The attitude to alcohol is different around the world as well. Um, you, you know, you, you're not going to get pubs in Islamic countries, right? <laughs> and they don't seem to have, because they rely on these communal bonds, they're probably not going to be as successful in big cities like Tokyo and so on. So the major corporations are not only uh, 
not kind of developing pub culture they are actively buying pubs and turning them into flats because it's um more efficient for making money they make more money doing that than continuing on as pubs the exception is weatherspoons and look how popular weatherspoons is in this country it tells you all you need to know about uh pub culture um other things as well like uh the morris dance people don't really do the morris dance anymore right um but that's a traditional English dance. Or we could see something like snooker, which they try to make global. They have a world championship, but most of the, the players are English or Scottish. There's very there's not that many from around the world. Whereas what they really want is something like football, which originating in England with the first games in England and uh, first international England and Scotland, the rules were made here. Some of the oldest clubs are based here. But it's taken off around the world. And we've just seen the World Cup final, watched by billions of people uh, from countries all around the world. That's the sort of thing that they want. So the free market has consistently eroded um, in the name of more profit and efficiency the original culture from which it sprang. because. It itself is not efficient enough. The scientific is also being used against it, uh, against the private sphere, actually, or the private pastime, because we've seen a shift in the 20th century towards what's often called the therapeutic state. Following thinkers like uh, Sigmund Freud, there's been this reduction of the human being to the material, and indeed, um, their health, physical and mental, and that the highest good in life is to be healthy. And for Freud, that involves various, you know, uh, regulation of the libido, of the sexual drive. It's more than the sexual drive, but that's its primary form. And governments have taken this to heart and have started to really say, well, we have the right to manage all of your affairs in the name of your health. So we will ban smoking in, in public areas, indoors, because it's bad for your health and for the health of others. We will limit the amount of alcohol you can drink because uh, before you're allowed to drive a car, because it's dangerous. We will tax sugar and salt because it's unhealthy for you. We will, um, uh, we will uh, lock you down in your home because it is for your good. It is to protect you from a virus. We will punish you for not getting the vaccine because it is good for you to get the vaccine. This is the same logic as the Puritans we saw earlier. Whereas for them, they, had, they thought they had the right to ban the theater or to ban Christmas because it's good for your soul. And thus they have the right to control your, your, your life. So these people believe on the basis, you, you know, that it's good for your health. Therefore, we have the right to do it for you or do it to you to control your life. And, and um, science has become a big part of that, that the greater understanding of the human body the developments in medicine and uh, technology have facilitated these coercive measures. We couldn't have been um, locked down in the past, I believe. I, th I think it required a certain level of surveillance and, you know, the existence of various um, medicines as well for this kind of approach to make sense. And indeed, it, it's getting even more invasive. The transhumanist lobby um well well the the medical professionals who kind of lean into this such as elon musk uh, such as the um uh, yuval harari and co they want to uh, insert implements into your mind um neural link various chips to monitor your health 24 7 and to essentially preempt uh, various uh, illnesses 
that they can be dealt with quicker. That sounds great, right? It's more efficient. It's going to save a lot of money and it will keep you healthier. But, but see, again, it's this idea that we need to be within your very soul, within your very consciousness, we must be there and control it. And if there's anything off, we will have to, you know, prohibit that and cure it. Even your thoughts will be accessible through this technology. So science is kind of being worked back around against the private sphere through this emphasis on the therapeutic. And indeed, um, the therapeutic gets extended all the time to um, political beliefs now as well. C.S. Lewis was writing about this in the 1930s. Others like Christopher Lash have also spoken about this, or Paul Gottfried, that often political views, which, uh, well, mainly the progressive left disagrees with, they will call uh, insane, phobias, mental illnesses of various kinds. And so they require cures. These phobias need to be um, changed through uh, various educational programs. If you have the wrong view, uh, such as in the USSR, if you're a Christian, you might have to, you might be arrested and placed within a psychiatric unit where you would undergo various um, pretty horrifying procedures on your brain to remove the ideas because uh, they're an example of your illness. The very way you think is... Um, is pathologized and so as it's in your interest because it's good for you we have the right to cure you and uh, you know no matter whether you object to it or not just because you you know your private sphere is totally invadable for the sake of your health so you can see that the again this puritan spirit has come back round with scientific it's it's trying to manage nature human nature in its entirety and defeat death in the process essentially i either or extend life as long as possible delaying and and it's this weird bind right so on the one hand you have a market economy which is appealing to this the private pastime uh idea and saying you can choose whatever you want and be whatever you want to be through your, you know, through your pastimes or through your private sphere. On the other hand, we are going to manage all of your life. And if you disagree, well, it's for your own good, for your health. And in a weird way, the health thing actually supplies the uh, market because because there's very little morals restraint or communal objection because it's very individualistic these pastimes we can indulge in them to our heart con heart's content whereas the uh, revelries of christmas tide the lord of misrule only lasted a finite amount of time today it lasts as long as you want as long as you can afford it and so somebody can eat far too much for them that's very unhealthy for them and their diet may be such that if they continue to eat that way they will they would normally kill themselves but healthcare the healthcare system is able to prolong that person's life far beyond its natural um it naturally would and so although the health system is trying to manage all of one's life, in the process, it actually perpetuates the private pastimes too. If, if, it, if it wasn't there, such, pe such a person would die very quickly. So it's, it, it's allowing for the, the consumption, literally here, but more generally, the consumption to continue. It's prolonging it, prolonging the desire, not dealing with the desire, but the effect. Which, which I think is a really interesting uh, dynamic. What, what's the kind of rub of all of this? Well, 
the reason why it's difficult to see or define immediately what is English culture or, you know, aspects of it, features of it, traits, is that large portions of it have been both through the empire and through uh, American, American hegemony have been expanded into universal norms, into things which the global economy takes for granted. And so what used to be un unique or perhaps distinctive or uh, a particular feature of English culture has become something which, although it's still here and deep within our culture, such as football, it is now shared around the world. And so we it gets subsumed or swallowed up within that broader context. And so that's why it can appear like there's it's there's nothing unique here, whereas actually what we've offered is, you know, it's it's actually all around the world. Now this leads to an interesting di dynamic because if Anglo culture or certain features of it have been made into universals, well, we can automatically see that there's a certain contradiction there that a particular culture's values become uh, the order of the whole world, but they aren't universal. They're exclusionary in certain ways. They have a certain logic, a cultural logic to them that makes sense perhaps here, but are maybe not uh, accepted in other places or changed in various ways in other places. And so you get this drive then to deconstruction that actually, oh, th this thing is arbitrary. It's not truly universal because the true universal uh, approach is that of equality and inclusivity. You want all people to have all of their desires fulfilled and sated and for all people's values to to concord, I suppose. And, and a, a set of values that emerge from a particular culture, such as England, is not going to be that. And so it runs up against um, its own abstraction. And so it's under relentless attack. That's, that's at least one reason why it's under attack. Um, but then you're, you're left in this strange position where on the one hand, you're told you have no culture. On the other hand, and, and, and that's because that culture is blown up into a sort of universal culture, certain parts of it. On the other hand, all those, all those things which have been blown up need to be deconstructed and torn down. And so you're left in this parallax where, where, where it's almost impossible to affirm that you have a culture but those things of your culture, which have been shared around the world, have to be attacked because they don't have the right to be universal or something to that effect. It's um, a very alienating and I think deeply distressing thing um, because you're not on a level playing field. It's not like if somebody went to Scotland and started saying you can't, you know, you have to stop singing the Jacobite songs. You have to stop selling the kilt because that's right and direct. No, this is saying this. This is a much deeper um, issue because it's hard to see where the it's hard to see the immediate features. So I wanted to kind of finish this up with. Um, a point from Oswald Spengler, of all people, and then uh, you know we'll we'll have a look at any comments or super chats at that point. So Spengler, in his book, um, what's it called again? <laughs> um, Man and Techniques, which uh, it's it's a kind of a summary or a short version of all of his ideas in. Well, he thinks it's clearer English. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I, I guess it was German, but uh, anyhow, um, he has an interesting couple of pages towards the end. And uh, let me uh, 
share this with you. And um, up to this point, he's really been arguing that Faustian civilization is going to collapse, that in its reach for the infinite, it's trying to share its, its qualities with the rest of the world, its uh, advantages with the rest of the world, trying to bring it all into conformity with this um, with this one culture. So it's constantly uh, grasping for more and more. But in so doing, it's given away its best secrets to its enemies, and it is in the point of collapse. And uh, he, he says the following, Faced as we are with this destiny, there is only one world outlook that is worthy of us, that which has already been mentioned as the choice of Achilles. Better a short life, full of deeds and glory, than a long life without content. Already the danger is so great for every individual, every class, every people, that to cherish any illusion whatever is deplorable. Time does not suffer itself to be halted. There is no question of prudent retreat or wise renunciation. Only dreamers believe that there is a way out. Optimism is cowardice. We are born into this time and must bravely follow the path to the destined end. There is no other way. Our duty is to hold on to the lost position, without hope, without rescue. Like that Roman soldier, whose bones were found in front of a door in Pompeii, who, during the eruption of Vesuvius, died at his post because they forgot to relieve him. That is greatness. That is what it means to be a thoroughbred. The honourable end is the one thing that cannot be taken from man. It's quite a moving passage. I think um so so I wanted to to raise this because I think it encapsulates a certain attitude within deep within English um history and culture which although um Spengler is not himself English he's articulating an idea which is shared across the Germanic and uh, uh, northern peoples of northern courage, as Tolkien would call it, to stand in the face of death, to be facing certain defeat at the hands of an enemy, to, to be against overwhelming odds and stand firm, to keep fighting out of love, maybe for your lord, out of duty, to protect your family, for doing what's right, and not compromising on that, to, to keep on going against such a foe, even though you know you will be defeated, that is Northern courage. We see it most clearly in Norse myth mythology with the idea of Ragnarok. The gods know that they will be defeated at Ragnarok, the end of the world. When the monsters come back, they will all be defeated. But they don't just roll over and lie down. No, they're going to fight it to the bitter end. So Odin, when he appears in battlefields and uh, gives a man a sign that he is, you know, he is he's going to die there, or a Valkyrie comes to to take a man from a battlefield, from his, you know, appointed to his death at that time, he's assembling warriors who will fight for him at at uh, Ragnarok. He knows he's going to lose. He knows this. It's, it's inevitable. But yet he fights. You see it with Beowulf. Beowulf, who, when he goes to fight Grendel, or Grendel's mother, he consigns himself to weird, to fate, or to doom. That it is in God's hands what happens. And he will trust to God. You know, whether he lives or dies, that's in God's God's control, he will go and fight nonetheless. You see at the end of, of Beowulf, where he goes to fight the dragon as an old man, as a king to protect his people, he knows he'll probably die in the process, and indeed he is fatally wounded, but he does it nonetheless. The Battle of Malden, where the uh, 
maybe over due to pride, Birthnoth, he he allows the Vikings to cross the river to fight the Saxons on equal terms. They are overrun and Birthnoth is slain, but his bodyguard, his loyal subjects, many of them remain steadfast, fighting to the end. They could have run, they could have fleed, but instead out of love for their Lord, out of duty to their people, they stand and fight to the bitter end, taking down as many Saxons as they can. That is Northern Courage. We see it maybe, maybe perhaps one of the most recent examples in the 19th century is the Battle of Rorke's Drift, seen in the film Zulu, where a very small garrison of British Empire soldiers had to fight off an army of uh, an army of Zulus numbering thousands. They stood their ground. They could have run, they could have tried to escape, but they knew their orders. They knew they had to defend that point. And they did so, even though they probably all thought they were going to die. Dunkirk is another example. The list goes on, this kind of spirit. And I think it's a valuable way of approaching this, this issue that we live in a we live in a situation where those traits to do with Englishness have been abstracted. They've been taken away. Well, not, not necessarily taken away, but expanded around the whole world so that we don't necessarily see it anymore in the same way as being particular to us. And then they've become under attack. And can we withstand the uh, the onslaught of big corporations, NGOs, governments, our own governments, scientific bodies, activists, and so on, and then and and you know other countries. I don't know, I don't know. It seems overwhelming, but we can stand firm nonetheless. We can embrace who we are. We can celebrate that, and I, and indeed, I think that is the best way to honor honor god in many ways that um when it, when you look at uh christianity in comparison to islam w- with islam there is one culture which dominates that is because the quran the literal word of god is in arabic and so that arabic language is a divine language and all that's associated with that in the you know, with Muhammad's life and so on, becomes expanded around the world. It's a monoculture. Whereas with Christianity, because God becomes incarnate in a particular culture in human history, there's a sense in which, and and then welcomes in other cultures too, there's a sense in which all cultures are created by the divine. None of them are perfect due to their fallenness. But the best way to honor God in terms of these sorts of conversations is to have all these cultures at their fullest and their most brilliant at, and that they're kind of living to the fullness of what they are in, in, in glory, in honor to God. And I think, I think that applies to us too, in this case. So we should embrace these aspects about ourselves, about our history and about our community and do it to the, you know, even though it seems overwhelming. And we should not lose hope at the same time. I I think in the Norse context, there is no hope of redemption here because at Ragnarok, the monsters win. And so that's why you see in many stories, like in uh, Ragnar Hairy Breaches, he dies laughing at his enemies. He makes maybe a a joke about his his situation and maybe at this that is um a, you know also about his captors that his sons will get their revenge one day so it's all a, a kind of dark humor but there is no hope of a redemption there's just a cycle of revenge and uh and darkness but from a Christian point of view, and I think Tolkien embodies this best in his Lord of the Rings, although one must fight in the face of ultimate defeat, knowing that there is 
the God, knowing that God incarnate in Jesus Christ and present in the Holy Spirit gives room for hope because it's up to him then what happens. As Beowulf says, he may choose to let you win. He may choose that you are defeated, but there can always be hope then. And we see this, uh, I think, in a, a passage by Christopher Lash in his book, The True and Only Heaven. I just want to uh, read it now. If I can bring it up. Uh, let's see. No, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> There we are. Sorry about that. If progressive and uh, uh, credit to Metaxi who sent me this. If progressive ideologies have dwindled down to a wistful hope against hope that things will somehow work out for the best, we need to recover a more vigorous form of hope, which trusts life without denying its tragic character or attempting to explain away tragedy as cultural lag. We can fully appreciate this kind of hope only now that the other kind, better described as optimism, has fully revealed itself as a higher form of wishful thinking. Progressive optimism rests at bottom on a denial of the natural limits on human power and freedom, and it cannot survive for very long in a world in which an awareness of those limits has become inescapable. And um, I guess we could say this is what Spengler's referring to as cowardice. The disposition properly described as hope, trust or wonder, on the other hand, three names for the same state of heart and mind, asserts the goodness of life in the face of its limits. It cannot be defeated by adversity. In the troubled times to come, we will need even more than we needed it in the past. And this is what I want to kind of encourage everybody to to look for in this moment that although much and i'm not even just talking about the question of english culture now but we face a great foe and in all you know if you're just looking at the odds it looks like we would be defeated but we need not abandon the goodness of life we should hold firm to those things which are good and which you know we are called to to um, be stewards of and pass on to the next generation. And so we must stand firm with Northern courage, as it were. And who knows, maybe there will be uh, unexpected victory against the dark powers. We can hope, we can hope. And indeed the period of Christmas that we're in now is the greatest, um, the greatest um, illustration of that possibility. You know, in um, many of the readings people hear during Advent, there's one from the, the book of Isaiah. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And this great light is the promise of a new Messiah or the Messiah that will come and restore the world. And uh, in the New Testament, we see that this is fulfilled in the person of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God, come present with the world, who shines the light in the darkness and offers salvation to all men, and in time will overthrow the powers of Satan and death and evil, and a new kingdom of heaven and earth will be born. That That is a source of hope, because even in the, even with all that's going on, that's happened. It's like um, it's, it's, many of you will have read the, the Lord of the Rings, and there's a part where Aragorn returns to Minas Tirith, but he does so in secrecy at first, and is kind of leaked by um, one of the women in the Houses of Healing to the rest of the city that the king has returned. This is a cause of great excitement, and everybody is just just kind of blown away because this is this nobody thought this would happen in their lifetimes. And it's almost kind of myth becoming history uh, before their very eyes. But their deliverance that they've waited for for so long has come to pass. And that feeling that I had when I read that, and I'm sure many of you have, of kind of just joy, is what 
uh, for Tolkien, for Lewis, and you know, much inferior but myself, that's what I want to encourage you to think about. That the incarnation is supposed to arouse that within us too. It's a source of hope. So that's kind of the end of um, the uh, the talk today. Uh, let's see what people have been saying in the chat. And uh, great to see you all here again. And I'm very grateful for you all tuning in um, on uh, the, the week before Christmas. Um, so yes, uh, hello again, Vingle, uh, Shiatori, Valtra, Patriotic, Archive. Let's see, England's regional cultures, Yorkshire, East Anglia and West Country still adheres to the old borders of the Saxon heptarchy. Yes, they do, they do. And so they still have that um, residual historic um um identity in a way that other areas you know if you say like the west midlands it doesn't even the very name does not have the same uh, rootedness um oh yes Fingal. i remember stepping off the plane in the us the first thing that met me was an hsbc commercial so it was shortly after the revelation that HSBC had been trafficking drug money for cartels. <laughs> yes, um, that's the irony, right? That uh, while they're telling us that uh, borders are bad and so on, it turns out that the borders that, that are obstacles to the very things that they are, the, the immoral and illicit things they've been up to. Uh, hello, Johannes Paleologos. Oh, sorry, I've absolutely butchered your name there. And Master Crafter. Yes, that advert was deeply subversive. You, you're totally right, Shia Tori, that, uh, and this is something uh, Carl pointed out, that slavery was abolished by the time that Victoria was queen. So it's not right to say that slaves were making her, her stuff or, uh, you know, producing her sugar because it wouldn't have been made by in her colonies by um by slaves they would have all been free uh hello 99 iron duke couldn't agree more couldn't agree more and everybody should check out 99 iron duke's um channel as uh, sh they should patriotic archives i i haven't seen um the videos yet but i will be doing that uh, after this Shiatori. Legal status of an English person doesn't exist. That's one. Two, British history begins for many socialists with the act of union and deliberately ignore the English peoples and mythology. Yes, very much so. And uh, that's part of the issue. That um, and, and my dad was making this point to me earlier. That English culture gets very identified with British culture afterwards and the other nations their cultures get defined in reaction or in juxtaposition to that kind of norm. So that's part of the issue as well. Yes, yes. Uh, the home and the cottage, as Vingle says. It's uh, quintessential, you know, if you were to draw a landscape or a, some architecture which represents England, uh, I think that would probably be a, a good example. Mm, I've heard of this, but I, I'll need to check it out. Uh, let's see. Yes, exactly. Serfdom did not last long in England. And it was actually, in the medieval England, uh, it was um, a crime to have slaves. And it was only with the um, with the Stuarts that you start seeing slavery in the colonies again, really. So it's uh, it's funny that modernity actually reintroduced with the Enlightenment slavery. It wasn't um, medieval at all. Yes, I think that's right. Um, but the question, so th this this would be an interesting question. And uh, we don't have time to go into it now. But is happiness a justification um, for governmental policy or who should be in charge? In democracies, as we have them now, that seems to be one of the, the key factors, like who will make me happier? But actually, like, would it be better to judge whether a, a, a ruler makes a, a people more virtuous, perhaps? 
that's the case, I would wager Cromwell wins on that score compared to King Charles II. Um, but uh, what values do we assess who should rule and how society should be governed? We often take them for granted. So like this health thing, right? It's, it's taken almost as um, obvious that um, the government, corporations and so on have the right to control your life uh, or to do things that will affect you if it helps your health. And you'll see people make this argument all the time, whether it's physical or mental health. It's affecting my mental health, therefore you shouldn't do this. And so on. And it's almost uh, taken as a foundational principle which is unchallengeable. Same with happiness. Um, who are you to judge me? It makes uh, I I want my children to be happy, so on and so forth. Biaki, good to see you. Always good to see you, friend. I noticed an English feature on some coastal Danish houses. Those thatched reed roofs. Yes, you do see quite a few of them, um, particularly around fishing. Kind of communities, I believe. Uh, there's a few rounds where I live. Um, yeah, totally. And that's an important factor that uh, the trade, that trade has been a huge part of our um, history because we are an island, right? And so um, that includes export and import. So importing all of these goods to uh, to sate market demand or to create demand for the market and then at the same time uh exporting all not just the goods but the values across the world phil butcher good to see you we need a hierarchy of meaning too yes indeed yes indeed and uh one of the things that's been totally lost with modernity is that there are that there are things higher than the material, that not everything's reducible to quantity and to how much stuff you have. There are there are things more important than how long long you live. Actually, there are things such as like how you you know loving another another person, be that your wife, your children, what you did for your community, for your nation, what works of greatness did you do how did you glorify god these things are much more important than how long you live or uh, how much wealth you have but we seem to have reduced the hierarchy of meaning to happiness and health and maybe a few other things too um jd good to see you thanks for tuning in same lady of shallot always lovely to see you and um, yeah, it's uh, hopefully one day, we were talk talking about this in uh, one of AA's streams, I think it was a cigar stream, uh, that one day we might be able to get round to doing a stream together on courtly love or the development of love in the medieval court. So that'd be really good. So hopefully in the new year, we'll be able to, uh, to do that. Um, what's going on here? Robert Frost. Good fences make good neighbours. Robert Frost. He was right. I do not know that poem, actually. But uh, I see Vingal and Lady of Schlott saying I should uh, uh, do a, a discussion of. Um, I'll look into it. I'll look into it. Hmm. <laughs> Lady of Schlotz getting an own channel. Um, have just done an introduction. I'd love to look at that poem. Yes, you must do it. It's hard to find time, I know. Yes, everybody should subscribe when it's an released Lady of Schlotz channel, and we will all go and uh, be moderators for her chat. That would be excellent. <laughs> so um, we're, we're getting towards the end now. Uh, so that this is going to be my final stream before Christmas and the end of amazing adverts, uh, advent even, adverts, uh, Freudian slip. Um, 
next week there will be a stream on Tuesday. It, we're going to be finishing the Nutcracker um, by Hoffman, the book which Tchaikovsky's ballet is based upon. So it'll be a nice cozy uh, Christmas stream filled with magic and wonder on the 27th of December. And then after that, the next stream will be in the new year. And we are going to be seeing a return of the Tolkien quiz, the great Tolkien quiz. This time, I have written the questions myself because I have two very knowledgeable men who are taking on the challenge. We have the returning champion, Apostolic Majesty, and up against him will be Todd Lewis from Praise of Folly podcast. So two, two, two individuals who probably know more than me about Tolkien's law. And so I thought I couldn't just use the Lord of the Rings trivial pursuit questions. That's not on their level. No, we're going to be going through not just the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit and the Silmarillion. We'll have questions from the Book of Lost Tales, the histories of Middle Earth. We'll have questions about things beyond the Middle Earth legendarium. Uh, such as um, Leaf by Niggle, Farmer Giles of Ham. We'll have questions about Tolkien's philosophy. There may even be uh, a challenge of singing some Tolkien. Who knows? Who knows? And, of course, I, 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 last time we had the chat playing as the third competitor. Should I do this or not? I'm not sure. I, I'm 60%... Uh, saying yes, that the chat can be the third against these two. As uh, uh, Muktuk says, this epic jewel of wizards, can the chat defeat Todd and Apostolic Majesty? That would be quite something. Well, we shall see. We shall see. Hopefully you'll be able to join me for that. It'll be a good fun at the start of the new year. Till next time, I'd like to, well, thank you all for tuning in. And have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we, I hope to see you all again in the very near future. God bless you all and good night.